All right, so good to see everybody here. We invite your attention to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We just began this chapter on Wednesday night before we stopped. Chapter 8 was a very interesting chapter to say the least. We talked about demon possession and uh, what those demons are and why they uh, inhabited people's bodies in the first century. So uh, we move on to chapter 9. And there's another difficult subject mentioned here in the earlier part of chapter 9 that we'll talk about this morning. So I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you had a great week last week. And I hope that this week is uh, even better than was last week for you. So we're glad you're here this morning. Let's begin in uh, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, He entered into a ship and he passed over and came to his own city. Now, my initial thought was Nazareth. But what is that city most likely, according to the context and according to the previous chapter? Capernaum. Now, I did not know this until I began this study, but uh, I read commentators and even evidence in the Bible that Jesus spent most of his ministry in the city of Capernaum. And I always thought that he just stayed in Nazareth, but the truth is, uh, when you do a little research, he was born in Bethlehem, he was reared in Nazareth, and as an adult, he lived most of his life in the city of Capernaum, which is by the Sea of Galilee. And I uh, have a map here I'll share with you. You can see it just north of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jerusalem is pretty far away, and Bethlehem is just six miles south of Jerusalem in that area. So uh, he traveled quite a bit in order to, to do his ministry. Uh, as you can see... There it is again on the north part of the Sea of Galilee. And that time you can see Bethlehem in there. But if you were to zoom out, okay, and look at a world map, this is the nation of Israel. It's what they would call the Holy Land of the Old Testament, okay? Uh, these are the shores on which Jesus walked and the places where he taught, things like that. So it's across the world. It's a long way away. But there it is again. And you can see with all the names of all the different nations according to where Israel is located. All right. Now, I want to talk to you about something in uh, verses 2 and 3. And I'll see sort of what your thoughts are on this. Notice, he came into his own city and behold, they brought him uh, a man who was sick of the palsy lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Now, why did they think that Jesus was blaspheming? Who on earth is the only person or who in the world has the only power to forgive sins? Only God. Only God. So basically they're saying, uh, you are saying that you have power from God that you do not have. Now, did Jesus have power on earth to forgive sins? Yes. I can think of right now, there was a man hanging on a cross next to him. And he said, will you remember me when you come in your kingdom? And Jesus told him, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus had the power on earth to forgive sins any way he wanted. You know, it's funny to me. People say, I want to die like the thief on the cross. <laughs> I'm thinking, now wait a minute. So you want to be crucified, all right? You want to be forgiven of your sins right at the last moment? You know, that's, that's not smart to say that they want to die like the thief on the cross. Well, friend, the, the thief on the cross was a totally different scenario than anything that is about forgiveness today. So when, that's a whole different subject. But Jesus, he could have forgiven that thief any way he wanted to because he was looking him right in the face. But today, people have to obey the gospel. They have to believe and repent, confess and be baptized. Now, I want to study about something just for a minute. Okay, let's talk about this man who was sick. 
Now the Jews, they thought that people were sick or born with sicknesses because of things that they had done wrong. Have you ever met someone who was sort of superstitious like that? They thought maybe because their child was born deformed or something that God was punishing them. Well, that's exactly what the Jews thought. Now, I want to look into this just for a moment, okay? And I'll share with just a few scriptures before I go on. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, you'll notice that Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see the Jewish reasoning there? He said, well, his family, you know, they, they must have been terrible because they had a child that was born blind. Well, that's not always true. Something I'm learning in the Bible is that bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. Is that true or false? Oh, that's true. You think about Job. The Bible said that Job was a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil, but he lost every single thing he owned. I don't know if any of you ever have heard of Tim Hawkins. Anybody heard of him? He's a, like a, a religious comedian. He, he's really funny. And he doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to be vulgar to be funny. I, I think it's really uh, neat the way he does things. But he, the, the other day I was watching something on him and he said something about Job and he said, you know, think about Job. He said he lost everything, but he kept his wife. <laughs> he said she must have been a real piece of work. <laughs> Well, you think about Job. He, he lost everything. Well, Job didn't do anything wrong. I'll give you a couple more and then I'm going to stop for a moment and talk about something a little more difficult. In Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, now this is a passage that we usually quote all the time. You know, we say, you know, uh, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And that's, you probably hear that at the end of a sermon a lot. But what we don't usually study is the context around that passage. Why did Jesus make that statement? Well, there were some things that happened to some people, and Jesus is asking the question, do you think, number one, that these things just came out of the sky and fell on them or destroyed them because they were sinners? No, they just happened. And the truth is, we don't know when these things will happen to us. Okay, notice these. He says, There were present at the season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Did Pilate just decide that, you know, hey, I think these people are really wicked, so I'm going to teach them a lesson? I think Pilate just had something against the Galileans and he wanted to kill them. He wasn't doing this for God. <laughs> you know, God wasn't punishing the Galileans because of what Pilate did. No, it just happened. What Jesus is telling them is, he said, you may want to start thinking because it could happen to you. Then he moves on to another scenario. He said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Or he said, or do you think that those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all them that dwelt in Jerusalem? He said, no. <laughs> it just happened. Sometimes bad things happen. And what he's telling them is, we need to be ready. Well, um, just because there are bad things that happen doesn't always mean that is connected directly with sin. So when you're reading in Matthew chapter 9 about this man who was born with the palsy, that's what the Jewish people are thinking. You know, this man has done something wrong. His family has committed some kind of sin for him to be born this way. All right. In verse 3, it says, There were certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. Now, in the Bible, there's mentioned what is called an unpardonable sin. What is that? Rebellion. 
Okay? All right. But can rebellion be forgiven? Up to a point. Up to a point? Okay. I see what you're saying. So if a person does not repent, it cannot be forgiven, right? Right. Okay. All right. Now there's a lot of debate on what the unpardonable sin is. What does Jesus call it by name? What, what does he call it? The sin against the sin against the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that just for a minute. There was a young lady who was convicted of stealing and she had stolen some food. And anyway, when the grocery store clerk found out what she had stolen, it was some canned food. And anyway, she had to go to court. And the judge asked her, he said, well, what did you do? What, what were you stealing? She said, well, uh, I stole a can of peaches. And the judge said, well, how many peaches do you think are in that can? She said, I don't know, maybe five or six. He said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll sentence you to five days in jail. But the grocery store clerk was there at the courtroom and he stood up and he said, uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but she also stole a can of peas. <laughs> I guess there may have been a few hundred peas in there. But you know, you think about forgiveness. Um, you ever felt like you could not be forgiven? Like you were the one who took the can of peas? <laughs> now, how long would that take to pay that off? You know, as preachers, we come across different scenarios and people have come to me in the past and they say, well, I don't know if I've committed the unpardonable sin or not. How would you answer them? We've got to understand then, possibly, what is this? Now, there's a lot of religious debate. You know, scholars all over the world dif differ on what the sin against the Holy Spirit is. But to me, I like to keep things very simple. Let's keep it on the surface. What is the context of what we're going to talk about here in just a minute? All right, let's go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. I'm going to present two difficult things to you today. Will somebody please read Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Now, what exactly is happening here? Jesus is performing miracles. He's casting out devils. And they say to him, well, he's doing this by the power of the devil. So their reasoning is backwards. And Jesus answered them and said, what do you mean I'm doing this by the power of the devil? How can a devil cast out a devil? What he's telling them is, I'm doing this by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 28. He said, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies where with whosoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. So if we were to say that the unpardonable sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit and blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. In the context, what would that mean? You're afraid to say, aren't you? <laughs> You're like, well, I want to tell you, but I'm not, I'm scared it might be wrong. Now, I understand. But I, I, would keep, I would keep it simple and put it this way. If a man saw a miracle performed and he said that that was done by the power of the devil, he is completely discrediting the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what he's talking about. 
I mean, in the context, that's exactly what he's talking about. So he said, all the blasphemies in the world could be forgiven. But if you deny the fact that the Holy Spirit is real and that he is really working this miracle, you can't, you can't be forgiven. I mean, you, you're denying everything that, that, you know, salvation is supposed to be about. Now, how do you think we got this Bible? Well, we got it by the, the Holy Spirit. So today, if someone were to deny this Bible, guess what they would be denying? The power of the Holy Spirit. So, somebody would say, can a person commit the sin against the Holy Spirit today? In context, in Matthew chapter 9, we don't have miracles today. So, in that sense, no. But a man who denies the work of the Holy Spirit for redemption through the gospel of Christ, if he does not believe the gospel, he cannot come to terms with God. It is impossible for God to forgive that man. So, in that sense... I would say yes. But directly in context, uh, this same sin does not even exist today. You would have to be able to see a miracle performed. All right, any question or comment before I notice a couple more? All right, I want to go to Hebrews chapter 6 and notice this very same principle, but worded in a different way. Hebrews chapter 6. Verses 4 through 6. Now, why was the book of Hebrews written? Do you remember? Okay, yeah, make your faith stronger. Definitely so. Because uh, there are some Jews that were doing what? They were going back to Judaism. They were going back to Judaism. And definitely they needed their faith strengthened. They need to be able to press on. You'll find the term better... Better covenant, better high priest, better sacrifice, better priesthood, all these terms in this book. So yes, definitely so. But look here in chapter 6. There were some who would fall away. They would turn back and you can't get them back. In fact, the Bible uses the word impossible. It is impossible to get them back. All right, will somebody read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Okay. It's impossible. But notice why. Why is it impossible? He even tells why. They were once enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift. What is that? I would say that's they've seen a miracle performed. The gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he elaborates on that. He said they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They have seen and witnessed miracles being performed. But he moves on and he said, they've tasted the word of God, the powers of the world to come. And if they fall away, it's impossible to get them back. Well, why? <laughs> because once you discredit the work of the Holy Spirit, where else are you going to go? You know, the Holy Spirit is the one who, who draws people. In the first century, it was through miracles. In this century, it's through the Word of God. So if I lived in the first century and I heard an apostle teaching and preaching, and he said, okay, if you don't believe that this is real, I'm going to perform a miracle and show you. And he brings someone back from the dead and we say, what? I don't, I don't believe that just happened. Where else can you go now? Like there's, there's no, there's not a next step. 
Well, that's what he's talking about. These people, they saw the miracles performed. They heard the preaching plain and clear, and they still denied it. They still said, I do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he said, well, it's impossible then. I don't know what else we can do. There's no other way we can get these people back. All right, what are your thoughts? Anything you want to add to that? Okay. So, there is a blasphemy going on in Matthew chapter 9. But you know what? There was a lot of that against Jesus. There was a lot of blasphemy against Jesus all the time. But, he said, that could be forgiven. But whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit, there, there's not really anywhere else to go from there. All right, let's continue. Matthew chapter 9. Jesus told him, he said, Be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Behold, certain of the scribes within themselves, they said, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he said, Where think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. So he told them why he said that. He said, well, I could have just said, all right, be healed and walk. But, you know, I wanted you to realize that not only did I have the power to heal him, but I had the power to heal his soul. And he gave an explanation as to why he did that. All right. Now, there's another subject that I want to address here in just a moment. And uh, let's see here. All right. We'll go on a little bit further. I'm trying to see uh, where I'm at here. All right. Verse 7. He arose and departed out of his house, but when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Now, why is that significant? Why is it significant that they marveled that this power was given to Jesus? Think about it in this light. What is this book about? What is Matthew trying to prove? That Jesus, is the Messiah. that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. That's right. He's doing this through the Old Testament scriptures. And now in the last several chapters, we've noticed, what, seven miracles? Maybe eight now. It's interesting. You look in chapter 8, verse 17, after he just performed miracles, healed the sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Everything that Matthew is writing about is confirming the fact that Jesus is really the Christ. So it's interesting in chapter 9 in verse 8 when it says the multitude saw it, they marveled and they glorified God. That's exactly what Jesus wanted to accomplish by performing these miracles. Okay, There's a reason why he's writing that on there. It's not just to say, you know, oh, this was a great event. You know, of course, people were marveling. No, he, he's trying to nail it down. The Old Testament scriptures verified that Jesus would perform miracles and heal people. And this is more proof. That's what he's doing. This is more proof that he is the one of the Old Testament. All right. Verse 9, Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and said, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. That's the writer, by the way. Matthew the Apostle. Came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto the disciples, Why eat your master with publicans and sinners? And Jesus heard that. He said to them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now here is difficult number two. Go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Now, see if I can get this right. What does that mean? What are your thoughts?
there was a guy, he said, you know, today I donated my watch to a poor man and I was so thankful when he put the gun back in his pocket. <laughs> you know, I'm so thankful that number one, God does not force me to obey Him. Number two, I'm so thankful that He so freely offers forgiveness to everyone. You see, God is not a tyrant, you know? He's, he, he's not like an old Chinese emperor who, that if you didn't bow down, he's just going to cut your head off. You know? He gives us opportunity to straighten things out. Now, we will be punished if we don't do his will. But what in the world did Jesus mean when he said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice? Brother yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that, that is definitely, I think you're hitting the nail right on the head there. I want to give you some scriptures, okay? Let's first look at this from the, this is a quote from the Old Testament. Does anyone know where this is found, by the way? Maybe you have a side note in your Bible there. This is a quote from the book of Hosea, chapter 6 and verse 6. So let's go back to the Old Testament and figure out what Jesus is meaning when he's quoting this Old Testament passage, okay? Now, Hosea is a very interesting book. It is about a man who has a wife that is very unfaithful. In fact, she is unfaithful with many different men. She is what we would call a prostitute. And Hosea has to go out and not only find his wife, but he has to buy her for himself. Now you think about how humiliating that would be. Well, this is the context of what the book of Hosea is all about. And God said, Hosea, that's what Israel has done to me over and over and over again. Why would he go buy her back? He loved her. That was his wife. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what 99% of us would say. And that's the point of the book. God could have done that. God could have said to Israel, you are ridiculous. It is us. It, is, it really is. For most of us today, that's a lot of times what our relationship is like with God. And think about it. He, he could have done that to us. He could have done that to Israel. He could have said, look, I'm done with you. All right? I've had it to hear. But he didn't do it. And that's really the point of the book of Hosea. So when you come to Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6, that's what's going on. And Jesus quoted that. He took that, that whole setting of what the Israelites knew applied to them. And he said, I would have much rather have mercy than sacrifice. Now, I'm going to give you some scenarios of what that possibly is, but here's the quote. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, burnt offerings are important. But what he's saying is you could bring all the bulls you want. You could bring all the money and put it in the plate you want. But if I don't love God from my heart and I'm not trying to serve Him faithfully and really do His will, it doesn't, mean any, it doesn't mean anything. It's worthless. In fact, we're going to notice some times in the Bible in just a minute where this scenario actually took place. People were still trying to offer God all these offerings and they were trying to, you know, appear religious. But the truth was, their hearts were not in it. Let me give you some scenarios here. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. Uh, in fact, before I, I meant to mention one other thing before I go there, we often remember a famous verse just two chapters back from Hosea 6.6. 6. It's Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Same idea, just worded a little bit differently. He said, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, and because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, seeing that thou should be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, and I will also forget 
the children. And as they were increased, so they sinned against me, and therefore I will change their glory into shame. So they, they cannot just keep showing up and offering these sacrifices. God said, no, look, I would rather give you mercy, but you have to do what I say. You know, uh, uh, Hosea's wife, Gomer, she eventually had to come back and stay. You know, this was, this was pretty much her last chance. This was it. And God gave Israel basically one last chance. And he said, if you do not stick around this time, I will send you into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And he did it. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. So the, the book of Hosea is sort of a preparation for these things that were going to happen to the nation of Israel. Now, let's talk about this idea of sacrifice for a minute without having a heart for sacrifice. You meet a man by the name of Saul. At first, he was a good man. His heart was right where it needed to be. He was a very humble man. But as he went on as king, he began to develop this really rebellious spirit. He, he thought that he was God, really. He did his own things. You'll even hear about Saul consulting witchcraft on one occasion. God told Saul to completely destroy the Amalekites. He said, you destroy man, beast, you burn everything. Do not keep one thing. But it's interesting how he reasoned with this, okay? Let's look here. We've got about five minutes left. I'm going to notice this pretty quickly. 1 Samuel 15, verses 13 through 15, it says, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now, who remembers what that commandment was? It's pretty interesting how this happened, because Saul obeyed God. He went to war with the Amalekites, but right before war, he said, oh, I forgot to offer a sacrifice. He didn't have time to wait on Samuel. Samuel was the priest. Now, under the Old Testament, you could not offer a sacrifice without a priest. Okay? But Saul, you know, he's in a hurry. <laughs> he's like, man, we're going to war. Uh, I can't go to war without offering God a sacrifice. So he offered it by himself. He clearly broke the law. So that's what he said. Samuel finally arrives, you know, the priest walks on the scene and he said, all right, we're ready to go. I offer my sacrifice. And Samuel said, you did what? Interestingly enough, another part in this further section here, he was told to destroy everything. He didn't do it. So Samuel said, what do you mean then you did the commandment of the Lord? You were supposed to destroy everything. Why do I hear the sheep? Why do I hear the oxen making all this noise? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest they have destroyed. And he said, well, we kept it for the Lord. That makes it good, right? Uh, he's committed two sins now. Samuel said, The Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. And wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spool and did evil in the sight of the Lord? And he said, No, I did. I obeyed the voice of the Lord. <laughs> You'll notice in the end there, in that section, notice what he said. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Do you know what a modern application of this would be? There's a lot of modern applications, but one that stands out to me is, if I disregard the worship service, and I just don't show up. It's saying to God, you know, I, I really am not too concerned 
with what you want me to do. That's totally different than being tempted and being drawn away and enticed, is it not? Every person in this room is going to experience temptation and there are probably times when we may give in. And we feel bad about it and we'll go on later, we'll ask God for forgiveness. But you see, this is a little bit different. This just says, you know, God, I, I really don't care if you want me to be there or not. So it's a dangerous thing. It's one of those things that Saul is experiencing. You know, he said, you know, I just really don't care what you said, how I need to do this. I just think I'm going to do it the way I want. Well, God says, I would rather give you mercy. That's what I really want to do. But there are terms to that. The sacrifices don't mean anything if we're not willing to meet the terms for God's mercy. All right, I'll give you one more and then I'm going to close for today. In the book of Isaiah, he said, what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? He said, I'm full of burnt offerings and rams. You know, I, I delight not in the blood of bullocks and lambs and the he goats. He said, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my course? He said, why are you coming to church? Why are you bringing this offer to, offering to me? He said, I'm tired of all these offerings. Bring no more oblations and incense. They're abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of ascending. He said, I cannot even away with them. Your new moons and your appointed feast, he said, I hate them. Why does God feel that way? Because they didn't care. Thank you so much for your attention today.